This lesson picks up where we left off in the lesson on completing the square. So in this lesson, I want to introduce the quadratic formula to you. Now because this lesson is a continuation, I definitely recommend you watch the last video first. But in the last video on completing the square, we covered this example. So just to refresh your memory, we tried solving x squared plus 6x minus 7. The first thing we did is that we moved the 7 to the right hand side to get this expression over here. Then after this we completed the square to add 9 to both sides. Once we had done this, we realized that x squared plus 6x plus 9 is the same thing as x plus 3 all squared, so therefore we replaced this for x plus 3 all squared. After we had done that, we then decided to square root both sides and then add the plus minus, and then we moved the 3 to the other side to find that the answers were 1 and minus 7. So in this lesson, we want to repeat these exact same steps for the general quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. And in this quadratic, a, b, and c can be basically any number you like. So the first step we have to perform is to move all the pronumerals to one side and all the constants to the other side, as we did over here. You can see that everything with an x ended up on the left and everything without an x ended up on the right. So that means the c has to go to the right, but it gathers a negative sign when it does that. However, there is a bit of a difference between this form over here and this one over here. Namely, in front of the x here we have an a, and in front of this x there's no a at all. So what we're also going to do is we're going to divide all of the terms in this expression by a. So now that everything's in place, and we have nothing in front of the x, then we're ready to move on to step 2, which requires us to get only one x as we have over here. Now in our example over here, the way we manage to write this in terms of only 1x is by drawing up this square over here. So I'm going to do the exact same thing for this particular expression over here. Let's draw out a square and figure out what the missing sides are and what we need to add to both sides to actually complete this square. So we're going to start by looking at the left again. If we look at x squared over here, we can put x squared in this square over here, just as we did for this example here. And that means that this side over here is going to be x, and this side over here is also going to be x. So in the example we did, notice that we had 6x over here, and half of it ended up in this square, and the other half ended up in this square. If we look at bx on a, if we then half it as well, we're going to get bx on 2a over here, and also bx on 2a over here. Now we can also write b on 2a times x as b on 2a all times x, right? And that means the only way we could have gotten this square over here is if this side is x, then this side must be b on 2a. And the same thing must also go for this side over here, because we have b on 2a, which is this side, times x, which is this side. And finally, the square that we were missing over here is going to be b on 2a times b on 2a, which is the same thing as b squared on 4a squared. So therefore, to get to this step over here, we have to add on b squared on 4a squared. And that is actually correct if you look at it. In this particular example, a is 1 and b is just 6. So if we just do 6 squared, that's going to be 36, and then divided by 4 just gives us this 9 that we added on before. Now in this example, this looks a lot more complicated than what we had when we did it over here. But I want you to understand that these are exactly the same. We've just actually chosen particular values for a, b, and c. Now to make this a bit simpler, in our example, we replaced this whole side over here for x plus 3 all squared, because we realized that x squared plus 6x plus 9 is the same thing as x plus 3 all squared. Now we can do the exact same thing for this square over here. In this particular case, we can see that this whole left hand side is the same as the area of our square over here. Now we can replace this whole left hand side for x plus b on 2a all squared. Now technically, I could call step 2 done. After all, we do have only one x now. But instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to also simplify the right hand side as well. I want you to notice that we want to get the lowest common denominator, which is 4a squared. So all we're going to have to do is to multiply the top and bottom of this by 4a, which gives you 4ac on the top and 4a squared on the bottom. Now after this, we can combine this into a single fraction where 4a squared is on the bottom. 
Now in this case, I'll call step two done because we have this in the same form that we had over here. I just want you to actually test this yourself if you'd like. I want you to imagine that a is one, b is six and c is minus seven. If you plug it into this formula over here, you'll see that it's the same thing as this number 16. Now in this third and final step, we just want to directly solve for x, which is exactly what we did over here. Well, to make x the subject of this left hand side over here, the first thing we want to do is to square root both sides. But when we do that, we have to remember the plus minus on this term on the right. To simplify this even further, we can just remember that the square root of a on b is the same thing as the square root of a divided by the square root of b. And therefore, we can put the square root on the top and on the bottom rather than on the whole thing like we did here. Now after this, I want you to realize that the square root of 4a squared is the same thing as 2a, so we can rewrite that too. And then as a final step, we can also take this b on 2a to the right hand side remembering that this positive will turn into a negative, and then we'll be at the final formula. Now the whole idea of the quadratic formula here is that any time you see something in this form, you can skip all of these steps because you know that the final answer is just going to be this. So therefore, if we had a problem like this one over here, we don't need to repeat any of these steps. We could just use this quadratic formula and save ourselves a whole heap of time. So let's do that. Okay, so first off, I just want you to remember that there's implicitly a 1 in front of this x, so let me just write it. But therefore, given this, we can see that these formulas are actually exactly the same. You just have to set a to be 1, b to be 6, and c to be minus 7. Be careful about that minus. So therefore, anytime you recognize something in this form over here, you can skip all of these steps and just jump directly to the quadratic formula. Now at this stage, all we have to do is to replace every a for 1, every b for 6, and every c for minus 7. So let's just do that. And then we just have to simplify this expression to get the final answer. You can see that minus 6 on 2 times 1 is the same thing as minus 3. Now 6 squared is just 36, but then minus 4 times 1 times minus 7 is just the same thing as 28. Keep in mind that this negative and this negative just cancel. Now if we wanted to, we could continue simplifying this. 36 plus 28 is the same thing as 64, so we can replace that too. And now the square root of 64 is 8, since 8 times 8 is 64, and then when you divide 8 by 2, you just get the number 4. So the answer is just minus 3 plus minus 4. And this is actually exactly what we had before when we did this the long way. The answer is just minus 3 plus minus 4. So in the positive case we get positive 1, and in the negative case we get minus 7, as we did before. And with that, I think we've finished the example I wanted to show you. But there is just one more thing that I have to say. In its current form, this quadratic formula here is a little bit intimidating. But I want to show you exactly what it's doing, because once you understand that, it's actually not so crazy at all. To properly make sense of the quadratic formula, I want you to imagine we define this thing called the discriminant, which we indicate with this triangle symbol. And we're going to define it as b squared minus 4ac, or in other words, it's just the part underneath the square root. If we replace this part under the square root for the discriminant, the formula looks a little bit simpler. Now writing the formula like this doesn't change it, but it just makes it look a little bit more approachable. I want you to understand that we're starting at some point, negative b on 2a, and then we're adding and subtracting this term on the right. I can draw this in a picture. With this picture over here, we can make perfect sense of what the quadratic formula is doing. I want you to understand that we start at negative b on 2a, which is this point over here. Now once we're here, we need to move to the right and to the left, which is indicated by this plus minus over here, to get to our two solutions that I've drawn here. So therefore, these two solutions are actually symmetrical about this middle point. Now this means that you can think of the discriminants, which is this triangle over here, 
as a proxy for how far we need to move to the right and to the left to get to our two solutions that I've highlighted here. Now therefore, if the discriminant is a positive number, you are always going to have two solutions because the square root of the discriminant on 2a is also going to be a positive number. However, it is possible to construct many quadratics where the discriminant is actually equal to 0. So if b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0, then the square root of 0 is just 0, and therefore you're going plus minus 0. Now that just indicates that we don't need to move right or left to get to our solution from this middle point, and therefore this middle point becomes the only solution. So we have only one solution. And then there's actually the final case. If you tried actually making the discriminant a negative number, which is totally possible, you're actually going to get the square root of a negative number. Now I don't know if you've tried this before, but the square root of a negative number is actually an error, and therefore there's just no solution to this problem. And therefore because of this, the value of the discriminant actually tells you quite a bit about what kind of quadratic you have. Now it is actually possible to construct lots of quadratics that don't have solutions, or have only one solution. You have to just do a lot of examples to actually see this in action. But now, I'd just like to summarize everything. The main point of this lesson is that any time you have a quadratic in this form, you can skip all of these steps over here just to get to this final answer over here, which is the quadratic formula. Now many people will actually extend this to write the whole thing over 2a, but I prefer not to do that because it actually makes this very clear. Now the main idea of the quadratic formula is that it starts off at some point negative b on 2a, which I've marked over here. After this we define the discriminant which is b squared minus 4ac, which we use to actually add on the square root of the discriminant divided by 2a and subtract the square root of the discriminant divided by 2a, and this gives us the two solutions to our original equation. Therefore, the discriminant is actually an incredibly important quantity whenever you're looking at any quadratic. If the discriminant is positive, we know that there are two solutions, because you're adding and subtracting a positive number to get to the two answers. If the discriminant is actually zero, then you don't need to add or subtract anything, because this whole term will just go to zero. So therefore, this middle point is the only answer. But in the case where you have a negative discriminant, you actually don't get a real answer. So therefore, we just say that there is no answer in the case where the discriminant is actually less than zero. Now this quadratic formula is incredibly useful and incredibly important. You don't want to keep repeating these steps because it's going to get annoying to do it over and over again. But anytime you see an equation in this form, you can just jump straight to the answer over here, and you don't need to do any of the work. In a sense, formulas do the work for you, which is why it's important to learn how to use them and exactly where they come from. But with that, I think we've just about completed our discussion on the quadratic formula. Thanks for watching another Trina video! If you want to say thanks, you've got to show your friends. Or maybe, you should just visit us at trina.org, where you can track your progress and have access to questions and heaps of other awesome stuff. Or maybe you should just like and subscribe. That works too. But either way, I'll see you next time.